questions to the Minister for Finance, and I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number one, please. The Department of Education has submitted bids of £4 million for Summer Scheme 2021 relating to primary, post-primary and EOTIS settings, as well as £5 million for a Youth Service Summer Scheme Programme 2021 for consideration as part of the Budget for 2021-22. These bids will be subject to consideration in light of funding available and competing pressures. No bids have been received from the Department for Communities for this purpose. Neither are any such bids expected, as this is not within their area of responsibility. I call Robbie Butler for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. Um, Minister, you may or may not be aware that eminent education psychologists in here in Northern Ireland and across the UK have called for the absolute need to integrate and assess uh, our students before they return to full time education. Just in terms of any further uh, fun, uh, funding bids that may be made from either department, will there be scope within your uh, department to meet those funding bids to make sure our kids get off to the best start post COVID? Well, the uh the member will know that in terms of next year's budget, we have a flat cash budget, which meant that departments really got a, a standstill rollover of the money they had this year, which is, is very challenging, particularly for departments such as education, which have a huge salary base as part of their, their, their department. Uh, but uh, uh, there will be COVID money available. There's, there was COVID money available for the end of this year, but there is COVID money available into the new year. The Department of Education has bid for some of that. Uh, has been earmarked for some of that as well. Uh, so I, I, it will be up, I suppose, to the, the Minister to prioritise that. I, I, I listened to him just as I was waiting to come into the Chamber, and uh, I mean, I agree with his view in relation to the, the benefits of, uh, for particularly younger kids, but for school kids generally, of being in the school setting. Uh, the absence from that and the pressures that that has created, and there will need to be a close look at how they get back into that system again. And if there are support that we can provide for that, I'd be more than happy to consider that. I call Justin McNulty. Minister, I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, you will be aware that some kids are participating in homeschooling on their mobile phones. What resources have you allocated throughout this pandemic to bridge the digital inclusion gap for young people in education via the provision of expanded IT support for schools and IT equipment for all children who do not have adequate IT at home for schooling? Well, he will know it's for the Department of Education to provide such resources, and uh, they did over the period of the course of the year bid for various uh, COVID-related funds, uh, some of which to use for uh, supporting kids who were struggling with home learning. Uh, and of course, uh, he knows, as I know, particularly from the constituency we both represent, the difficulty in access uh, to broadband support. That again is a matter for the Department for the Economy, who are rolling out the uh, Project Stratum scheme. Uh, and so it has been very, very challenging for families and for young people uh, to, to try homeschooling in good circumstances, but in circumstances where the IT support is not there, then that is difficult. We have had a responsibility, uh, uh, an initiative within my own department who have that uh, digital uh, responsibility for the broader civil service in, in rolling out IT support for vulnerable people, not, not for the school uh, scenario, because that's the responsibility of the Department of Education. And we have done that. We have run a pilot scheme which has been oversubscribed. I'm glad to say we'll continue to provide that support. Moving on, I call Andrew Muir. Number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My department has prepared an ambitious draft programme of phased uplifts to the energy efficiency requirements of building regulations for inclusion in the executive's forthcoming energy strategy options consultation. We will be refining this further and will consult as appropriate in due course as part of our ongoing work. The officials are currently focused on an urgent uplift to the current requirements for new buildings, which we plan to bring forward within this executive period, if possible. Officials are engaging with the Department's Building Regulations Advisory Committee and its special subcommittees on the details. Further uplifts will take into account technological advances and policy developments in other regions over the coming years. It seems likely that revisions made after 2025 would anticipate that all new buildings will routinely have very high building fabric standards and low carbon heating. Call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, detailed reply. Uh, a short while ago, I uh, sent a written question to the Minister and it was about uh, whether his department would take a lead in ensuring that unsafe cladding would be removed from buildings in Northern Ireland. And the Minister, in his response, stated that he had recommended a building safety programme and supporting fund to the Executive, but you were still awaiting the outcome of your proposals. Can the Minister provide an update on that? Well, the responsibility for the, these matters uh, 
rests across a range of departments. And what we want to try and ensure, well, uh, there is perhaps some merit in the discussion of having a single home for all of this. Uh, I think it would be very difficult to extract from various departments their, the, you know, the associated responsibilities. So what we have tried to get, uh, and I think there is an urgency in this, uh, in trying to do this, and I have brought uh, propositions to the executive to try and get a kind of uh, under the heading of the head of civil service to try and get an agreement across all the departments as to where each responsibility lies and a coordination function in relation to that. I have also said that uh, if, if there was to be a retrospective uh, or retrofit type scheme to address some of these issues that arose from that, I am very happy to look uh, at, at that uh, proposition. Uh, but we really want, I think, to make sure that the proper degree of coordination across all the departments and all those responsibilities is brought to bear in relation to these matters, because they are obviously, given the experience he refers to, very serious issues uh, and need to be addressed urgently. I call Kiva Archibald. Margaret, last can call you, and just following on from Mr Muir's question, I was wondering if the Minister could um, update on the progress being made on the recommendations of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Well, we obviously will have to be cognizant of that and look at the recommendations that come from that. Uh, I, I know there has been some uh, proposals developed in terms of looking at, at buildings already uh, across Britain, and we have looked to see whether Barnet consequentials will flow from that. Uh, but there are clearly very serious issues in terms of building materials and uh, the approach to testing uh, and the, the verification of testing, a whole range of serious issues which throw up, uh, I think, uh, questions for a range of departments here. And as I say, that the, one of the difficulties is that the responsibility for this uh, various aspects of this lie across a range of departments. So I think what we need to ensure is that we coordinate as best we can across those departments. We have, if you like, a, a central authority in terms of making sure that coordination works, uh, but that all of those uh, component parts then play their part and are resourced to do so to make sure that we don't have any such tragedy here. I call Rachel Woods. Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister if he or his department have considered the energy governments for the Northern Ireland Energy Transition Research Report commissioned by the Northern Ireland Executive, what his position is on the recommendation that a new Department for Climate and Energy Transition should be set up? Well, I, I, I have not personally considered it, uh, but I have to say that, uh, I mean, given the position of our budget next year, the idea of, of starting a, a new, completely new department would probably be more challenging uh, than the executive had resource for. I think in the context of a longer term strategic plan, programme for government, multi-annual budget, uh, that arguments around this sort of uh, setting up a completely new department would probably fit into that uh, time frame. Uh, and I'm certainly happy to look at that. I have to say between now and the end of the mandate with a rollover flat cash budget, then uh, what we want to try and do is bring the standards that we have up to the highest level in terms of environmental efficiency and other efficiency that the standards we have in terms of building are, are brought up as quickly. We have catch up to do. We have acknowledged that. Uh, and we want to do that as quickly as we possibly can. But in the longer term strategic type project that she's uh, referring to, I think that's, that's more than likely a, a consideration for an incoming executive beyond this mandate. I would ask that Linda Dillon be brought onto the screens. And I call Linda Dillon. With your permission, last concorda, I wish to group questions 3 and 15. I met with the Secretary of State on the 23rd of February along with the First and Deputy First Ministers and the Minister for Justice to discuss funding for the scheme. At the meeting, I pressed them on the need to resolve the matter urgently so victims can get payments they are entitled to. I highlighted the need for the British Government to make a fair contribution to the cost of the scheme in recognition of the changes they made to it. I have since written to the Secretary of State to confirm that I am content to recommend to him the Executive meets the full costs of the scheme as envisaged in the Stormont House Agreement, as well as any implementation and administration costs. We were due to meet again with them last week, and I hope, as a matter of urgency, that the meeting scheduled for tomorrow will go ahead. I remain absolutely committed to resolving the question of funding for the scheme. It is important that victims have the certainty they deserve about its longer-term funding. The Government's Actuary Department report around the potential cost of the scheme is being produced for the Executive Office and not my department. It would be for that department to decide on the release of it. And I call Linda Dillon for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. Minister has the Secretary of State given any indication as to whether there is any intention to fund your 
department in relation to the the scheme to give that assurance to the victims right across the, the north and right across these islands that they are going to get payment whenever the scheme does start? Well, I haven't had anything uh, very firm from him. I was told that the meeting that we were due to have uh, at the latter end of last week was postponed so he could some, have some discussions with Treasury. Uh, I sincerely hope that means that they are beginning to accept the responsibility that they have for a scheme that they had devised and legislated for and which went well beyond the scope of the scheme which the parties had agreed to at Stormont House. So if those arguments have begun to land with the uh, Secretary of State of the Northern Ireland Office, then that, that would be progress. Uh, I have nothing uh, firm in that regard to report, but uh, we look forward to the meeting with him tomorrow evening. Uh, I've been postponed from last, I think it was last Thursday, uh, and so I think that needs to meet as a matter of urgency. As the member will know, uh, the courts are awaiting the outcome of these discussions, and also the victims themselves, most importantly, are awaiting the outcomes of these discussions. Steve Aiken is not in his place. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for those answers. Um, as I understand it, the government actuaries have greatly increased their assessment of the cost of the scheme from several hundred million to over a billion pounds. Can the Minister explain why that, why that is? Well, the, the report was produced for the Executive Office, not for the Department of Finance, so I, I don't have the, the detail behind that. It, it, was, it varied from, I think, 600 million right up to 1.2 billion. I suppose that depends on the extent of people uh, who, who come into the scheme. It depends, perhaps, on whether people want upfront payments uh, or payments over a longer term. Uh, and there are so, so many uncertainties which were created by the very substantial expansion of the scheme uh, that was done under a previous Secretary of State. And that's why we have argued with them that while we want to uh, make sure, and we're absolutely committed to make sure, that victims get the payments that they need, uh, the government need to work with us because they, they took what was an original scheme uh, under which I'm sure he will remember from the Storm House talks. We were having discussions as responsibilities to who, who was to pay for that proportion of the scheme between us and the government. We talked about the pre-98 and the post-executive's responsibilities uh, from 98 and beyond. Uh, and then we end up with a substantially larger scheme that brought in a whole scope of new people. Now, I'm not disputing whether people are entitled or not entitled. That's a matter for somewhere else. Uh, but what we, I have the responsibility to do is try and find the resource uh, to do that. And the executive, given the state of our uh, resources over the next year, uh, I want to make sure that we are able to actually meet the requirements of victims. And that's why the government, I think, need to work with us. Thus far, they haven't. Uh, there are some indications that the Secretary of State and the NIO are, are beginning to engage. And I hope that they have something to offer us tomorrow evening. I call Paul Free. Uh, thank the Minister for his answers so far. Can I ask the Minister, even if agreement on funding was achieved this week with, when he meets the Secretary of State, what type of lead-in time is still required before victims receive uh, money? Well, it's the Department for Justice that will operate the scheme, so it would really be a question for them to answer. I have proposed to the executive, and the executive have made funding available for administration. We have already done that uh, on a number of occasions, made funding for the administration and implementation of the scheme. Uh, I, I suppose there, there will, when the, it, it begins its work, there will be an assessment as to whether people are, are looking for upfront payments or people are looking to get into a pension type scheme. Uh, and so these are things that are unknown until the scheme itself opens up. So it will be for the Department for Justice to manage that. What we want to ensure is that through our work with the government in London, uh, to make sure that there is sufficient resource in that scheme so that when it does open up, then we can meet whatever costs there are. I call Jim Allister. Um, now that the Lord Chief Justice has directed that the Department of Finance should be joined as a party to the ongoing legal proceedings, there really is shrinking ground in terms of avoiding this issue. Last week in this House, the First Minister gave a guarantee that the money would be paid when it fell due to qualifying victims. Can the Finance Minister give the same guarantee? Well, can I say, firstly, there would be no attempt to avoid this issue. Uh, the, the ground that has been created around this has been created by the Government in London. Uh, and it is very unfortunate, because it is not the place that any of us wanted to be. 
Uh, the Government in London took it upon themselves to significantly uh, expand the scope of this scheme. They added pieces of interest that came from the back benches of the Tory party into the scheme, and therefore they have a responsibility to meet the, the costs in relation to that. Uh, of course, uh, we are absolutely committed to making sure that the funding is available for the scheme. The Executive have made that clear time and time again. I think the First Minister recommended that, or re reiterated that. Sorry. Moving on, I call Lisa McHugh. With your permission, last I watched the group questions 4 and 14. As of the afternoon of Friday past, the 12th of March, uh, the total value of payments made from the localised restriction support scheme is £221.65 million. The amount paid to businesses in Derry City and Strabane Council area is £18,462.4 sorry, £18,462,477. The total spent to date in Mid-Ulster is £17,953,305. I call Melissa McHugh for a supplementary. I thank you. The Minister has actually adequately answered my supplementary. I call Emma Sheeran. I thank the Minister for answering the question that I had originally asked as well. Um, and I want to place on record at this point my appreciation to the, the Department and the team within LPS, particularly Leona Lees, uh, Ian Snowden and Lenny Padane, who I think at this stage see my name, and say, can I just ask um, the Minister when um, businesses that haven't received payment can uh, expect to, re to receive their, their payment for the last phase of the scheme? Well, I hope we're in the last phase of the scheme. If restrictions continue, we might be into further phases of the schemes. I'm sure we'll hear from you many times again uh, in, in, in between. Uh, can I say it's, it's businesses who are entitled who meet the entitlement, uh, and I, I think we're down to a very, very small handful that are still working their way through that. Uh, of course, some businesses would be disappointed because they were found not to be eligible for the scheme uh, and won't be getting payment from it. And I hope that the announcement I made earlier today will help some of those businesses in turn. Uh, but uh, as soon as we possibly can, I think it's over 98%. Uh, of cases now at this stage are dealt with. Uh, and it has been a very challenging scheme because, as you know, uh, and other members know, LPS is a rates collection agency, and we've had to turn them around and reprofile them to be a grant giving body. Uh, and we changed the, uh, the, the scheme of payments, I think, uh, a number of times. It, it escapes me now how many times they've actually changed. Uh, and we've uh, a range of three different payments, and times people have fallen onto the wrong payment scheme, and we've had to go back and, and refit that. So there, there have been a lot of challenges with this. Nonetheless, I think most people will accept that it was a very commendable scheme, which provided a very vital lifeline to an awful lot of businesses, and have kept them in a position that, as we hopefully move now into towards the ending of restrictions, businesses can get back to doing what they want to do, which is to start to trade again. I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Uh, Deputy Speaker, businesses will face many additional challenges as we move towards COVID recovery. Can I ask the Minister if he can detail any plans for restart grants to assist businesses when they are eventually able to reopen? Well, the, uh, the Department for Economy has put together a, a package of economic recovery. Uh, there are other aspects to recovery from this, you know, the social recovery. The recovery that was being discussed earlier in relation to schools, and, and there's a, a very broad recovery piece needed. But they have put together a package which uh, I, I will be proposing to deal with in our final budget paper, which should be coming very shortly to the Assembly. Uh, and I, I'm not certain whether there are restart grants included in, in that, uh, but it will be a matter then for the Economy Minister to bring forward such proposals. For our part in the Department of Finance, uh, I said this this morning in response. Uh, to some questions around my own statement. This is the end of our involvement, uh, I hope. Uh, we have done the rates relief for another year. Uh, we have a package of support, uh, business grant support measures going out, and uh, finance and LPS in particular are looking forward to getting back to doing what they do in relation to rates and managing the money. Moving on, I call Martina Anderson. I'll get the last can call you. Question number five. In recognising the importance of the social economy sector, I appointed Colin Jess, Director of Social Economy NI, as an advisor on the board. The board is working as a first priority to develop an enhanced model for delivery of social value in public procurement, which is linked to programme for government outcomes. The board has also agreed to, to work to build more capacity and resilience in local supply chains to ensure continuity of supply in future public contracts. 
These initiatives and Colin's contribution will increase the opportunities for local social enterprises to bid for public contracts, both as a main contractor and as part of the government supply chain. Gon Buikas Lesenara asked of Fragra. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, Minister, I uh, appreciate what has happened with regards to the appointment of Colin Jess, and I think that's deeply appreciated by those who work in the social enterprise uh, industry. And as you know, Minister, 94p of every pound that is spent. Uh, by the social enterprises is kept within the local um, economy, like places in, like Derry. So, can I ask you, Minister, would you engage wider with more representatives? I'm thinking of John McGowan and Derry, who's very keen to explore additional ways that they can increase their capacity to compete for public contracts. Well, it, part of Colin's function is to actually represent the social enterprise sector on the procurement board. So it's a two-way street. It's not just to bring his experience into board, but also to engage with the wider social enterprise sector. And he, he will do that, uh, I know, and has been doing this. Uh, I know that the, the person you mentioned has, has been talking to the department uh, from Derry. So I'm very happy uh, to engage with people uh, in relation to developing the best possible policy in the time ahead. And we do want to see opportunities for the social enterprise sector to be able to engage with tendering, uh, provision of services, uh, because uh, in my experience, wherever those have been provided and the, the added value that they bring in terms of the communities uh, that they are working with then is something which uh, the broader uh, government sector, I think, want to be engaged with as part of our programme for government commitments, uh, and I want to see that work as best as possibly can in the time ahead. I call Matthew Toole. Thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, uh, a couple of weeks back, the Finance Committee took evidence from the Construction Employers Federation. One concern that was raised was around clarity for uh, firms here, particularly construction firms, being able to uh, bid for tenders in the south. And they felt there wasn't enough clarity. Ironically, this was a detail that wasn't in the Ireland Protocol in enough detail in terms of pr um, protecting the oil island economy. So they're concerned that uh, northern businesses, northern constru uh, construction firms, could be at a disadvantage. Could you ask your department to, to take that away and look at it and, if possible, make representations both via Dublin, London, and Brussels to clarify that? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I mean, we, I'm not sure if it's the same uh, or a similar issue we dealt with a number of weeks back, and we got clarity on where uh, built-in firms who had a foot on both sides of the border uh, were only being judged in terms of their ability to bid for contracts here on the northern side of their uh, of the, the the capital that they had. The, the 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 value of the company was only being judged uh, on one side of the border, and uh, therefore it, it uh, impacted on their ability to play, uh, uh, bid for higher contracts. Uh, and that was rectified. That was an anomaly which uh, uh, hadn't been uh, really considered, I suppose, pre pre Brexit, and uh, it, uh, it it was rectified. So uh, I, I think there are sometimes these things, a bit like the Brexit and protocol experience, or are problems which arise, which, which either no one had envisaged or someone is misapplying what they think are regulations to certain uh, sectors which don't exist. Uh, and I'm very happy if he gives me the detail of that to look into it and come back to it. I call Mike Nesbitt. Speaker, I understand that uh, public procurement is worth around three billion per annum. Does the minister have a figure in mind for what the social enterprise sector should be pitching for? Well, there, that's actually part of the debate that the procurement board is having at the moment, and, and part of the, I suppose, the value of the reconstituted board, and has only really been reconstituted since just before Christmas, is to bring the various sectors in rather than having permanent secretaries. In, uh, no disrespect to the permanent secretaries, but you bring the sectors in. We have the construction people in. We have the social enterprise people. We have the small and medium enterprise uh, people in there. We have the various uh, centre of procurement excellence from uh, a number of the departments. Uh, and you get that kick around to say, what is the balance? Where does the balance lie? And, and that, that, is, uh, that figure is actually something that's currently under discussion uh, to see. So the social enterprise sector are given advice as to what they think they could step up to achieve, as well as others who think it might be a challenge for them uh, saying, uh, so I, I, I hope uh, in the near future from those uh, discussions, and they've been very uh, productive uh, and mature discussions, that we will get to where we see the balance should be here now. But we will always have an ambition to do better, uh, and I think we should have that ambition to do better. But let's get off to the right start. Moving on, I call Orlea Flynn. Um, question number six, Liddell. The Dormant Accounts Fund is being delivered by the National Lottery Community Fund and open for applications on the 12th of January this year. 
Phase 1 involves a flexible and responsive grant programme. Individual organisations, including social enterprises, can apply for up to £100,000 to be able to adapt to future challenges and be more financially resilient. The first phase will also support larger investments that will enable collaboration and develop new and, create, and creative to, to assist sustainability. It is expected that the first grant awards will be announced shortly. I call Orlea Flynn. Um, thank the Minister for his answer. Um, and I would like to ask the Minister if he does have any further update in terms of any more money um, being made available to um, social enterprises through the dormant assets. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, it, that, that will be the next phase, uh, and I, I look for, very much look forward to that. The dormant accounts, uh, as, as I said, has only just opened, but it's very substantial. Uh, amounts of money for social enterprise projects uh, to make them more financially sustainable and to uh, encourage that uh, uh, growth in them. Uh, and I, I think the last one I visited was in your own part of, of Colin uh, in, in West Belfast, a very, very progressive uh, social enterprise, but people who have had to focus a lot of the time on, on sustainability, on access and more finance and trying to generate more finance. And, uh, this is uh, the dormant accounts is to try and give them an assistance in doing that. So it's not always a question every year of trying to get more money and to stay uh, alive, if you like. Uh, the uh, dormant uh, assets then is, would be a much bigger fund, and we're obviously waiting on more detail of that coming through. Uh, but I hope it will, on the back of the dormant accounts uh, programme, then that it will give a substantial uh, bigger boost to the social economy sector. I now call Gemma Dolan. Gourmet, I'll get last can call you question seven, Lady Hull. I want to place on record my thanks to the civil service for their hard work and flexibility in response to the many challenges of maintaining and delivering services during the pandemic. I have met recognised trade unions about the civil service pay award, and my officials have had negotiating meetings with the unions. In considering the pay award, I aim to strike the difficult balance between recognising civil service colleagues for their work while managing public money carefully in the face of the most challenging economic position for many years. Although this pay award is for 2020, it will obviously have consequences for the future in terms of overall cost of a civil service payable, which is very large, so affordability is more critical than ever. I have therefore been considering a range of different options. I have circulated an executive paper, and the agreement of the draft paper would enable an offer to be made to the trade union shortly. I call Gemma Dolan. Minister, um, and I appreciate um, you having to strike a balance. Um, will the pay award give priority to those on the lowest pay? I am fully committed to, uh, to the new decade, new approach, aim of executive becoming a living wage employer, and Department of Finance officials are working to realise that aim for the civil service. I have also asked that other public sector employers consider how pay awards can be targeted to ensure that the payment of living wage foundations living wage. I am also considering ways in which the pay award for civil service can deliver a better outcome for lower paid workers. I call Matthew to Deputy Speaker, I'll be brief. Minister, I appreciate there are constraints as you've just uh, laid them out, but will you accept that, given some of the um, uh, last-minute spending allocations that, that are being made, and given the delay in announcing any details, there's real frustration out there among ordinary civil servants, particularly those in low pay, particularly those who've had to uh, really um, uh, do, you know, you know, work extremely hard over the past year to keep public services going. A lot of them are just very, very frustrated that there's been this delay in confirming a settlement. Well, I think they, they, they understand, as I'm sure most members will understand, that we have been grappling with a huge range of issues at this time. Uh, and of course, it, it, the pay award uh, for the, the, the public sector is not linked to that money that we're spending out at the moment. Uh, but nonetheless, I do want to get to a point of agreement very quickly. Uh, I have put a, a, a paper to the executive, and I hope to get agreement on that very quickly. And I will make an offer as soon as I possibly can uh, to the unions, because I do want to see this issue resolved to everyone's satisfaction. And I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, like uh, Mr. O'Toole, I think it's important that this issue is brought to conclusion. Also, uh, a number of months ago, or yeah, an announcement was made about the £500 payment to health and social care staff. And I think there was a recent update on that, that, that would, the costs associated with national insurance and um, PAYE would also be covered. Can the Minister give an update on when about these payments will be made? Well, they are a matter for the Department of Health. They asked for more money to assist them with that, uh, meet those costs because the, the British Government refused not uh, to, to treat these as a, a, a 
a taxation issue and a, a welfare receipt issue, so they, they uh, intended to extract their, their uh, take out of the £500 payment. So we have assisted the Department of Health in, in moving that up to the level that will account for that. Uh, I say that is a one-off payment. So what we are talking about here is the pay a settlement uh, award, which is, will be an ongoing payment for civil servants. But nonetheless, we were happy to assist the Department of Health, but they are responsible for the rollout of that. And that is the end of our period of time for listed questions, and we must now move on to topical questions. I advise members that uh, question number three's name has been withdrawn, and I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, thank, thank you. There, there is no doubt that the pressing issues of the climate emergency and environmental protection require interdepartmental strategy actions and, and indeed budgeting. Can I ask the Minister, in light of that, if he will or, or whether or not he can lead on a Green New Deal strategy for Northern Ireland? Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, I mean, he knows that we're facing into a very challenging budget next year, which means that the possibility of new initiatives uh, have, have been absolutely frustrated because uh, departments uh, have been only able to carry over the same amount of spend they had the previous year. So, really, to meet all of their pressures and requirements uh, is going to be a challenge in that regard. Uh, but I hope we do get to the stage. I hope departments do collaborate. I hope when we move to a multi annual budget aligned to the programme for government, we are able then to plot ahead and get into that, that type of territory. There are a lot of things can be done, and the departments spend that they currently have in the level of collaboration they should be trying to achieve with each other to improve the environmental outcomes. But I certainly hope that we are uh, able to get in as quickly as we can into a, a Green New Deal strategy. Call John Blair for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the, the Minister for that answer. Uh, and following on from that, can I ask that uh, as we move forward, uh, would there be merit in, in requiring all departments to review their baseline budgets uh, and spending priorities with a focus on the climate emergency? Well, that would be a matter for the Executive. Uh, 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 you know, that a department which, which to, I, I, I'm assuming it would be the Department for Agriculture, and Environmental uh, and Rural Affairs, uh, would perhaps bring a proposition to the executive that, that asked all departments to do that, but it would be a matter for the executive to decide. I call Paula Bradley. My thanks to LPS for all the work that they have done in assisting my office in the many, many inquiries over the past year. And some of those inquiries were around the LRS scheme and the sporting clubs and social clubs. And I know from some correspondence now I've received that some of those social clubs, the decision has been overturned and they've now got their LRS. But there's been others, and I just want to ask if there's any redress for those other clubs that should have applied for the Sports Sustainability Fund because they are sporting clubs, but were led to believe through correspondence that they were going to get LRS, but it was too late when they received the correspondence to say they had been turned down for them to apply um, for the Sports Sustainability Fund. Well, I know we did a discussion some time back uh, with the Minister for Communities and some of our senior staff in relations to try and make sure that the situation which you are now describing did not arise. We had a similar arrangement with economy when we were working between the, the schemes we were running and they were running, that people would apply to the wrong scheme, and then they might find they were out of time when they eventually realised it because uh, they, they needed to go on to a different scheme, to try and make sure we could pick those up so we can consider an application to one within time uh, as an application to another. So I know that was the objective of the discussions. I'm told that there was some progress made in that with, between officials, so I'm hoping that it isn't a situation where people who are thinking they were in the right scheme then find, find they're too late for the other one, uh, that we can actually pick those up and see. Uh, I think it would be a relatively small number in terms of overall uh, applicants for both schemes, so uh, I'm hopeful that, that we are able to do that. I know there have been a multitude of schemes that have gone out between our department, communities, economy, infrastructure, uh, a range of schemes, and it's very hard for the public and for those organisations that need support to try and navigate their way through those. So I think we should try and be flexible to make sure that nobody misses out. I call Paula Bradley. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer, and he's probably answered my supplementary now because we know that many of those sporting organisations were really, really good and got out to their members very quickly to say you need to apply for this. But others were absolutely dreadful and didn't. I mean, one of them is, is the likes of Lawn Bowls, where there's a lots of bowling clubs now and that are facing closure. So it's just to ask then if you can continue to have those conversations with the Minister of Communities and, if possible, if it might even be possible, to open up a second tranche of funding for those clubs that actually missed out the first time round. 
Well, I'm not sure about the, the latter part because that, that could take you into uh, issues where somebody else missed out and then you're into a legal challenge as to favouritism or somebody was in early but had the wrong information and, and perhaps hasn't uh, been approved. Uh, but I, I think you're right. Uh, most of the organisations responsible, the, the parent bodies, uh, were very good at advising their, their uh, club members uh, as to what they need to do and when they need to do it. Uh, and the fact that some sometimes by a bit of default got through into the LRA scheme and it was paying out earlier and in a more consistent way then encouraged others to try the same route uh, and, and what we don't want to happen is that people who have gone to the wrong scheme end up uh, suffering as a consequence if they were entitled to money from the other scheme so we'll, we'll continue to work together on that. I call Andrew Muir. Mr Deputy Speaker, and for the record, on the previous supplementary, I would declare that my mum is a retired member of the um, health and social care system. Uh, on Friday, the Minister announced the appointment of members to the Fiscal Council and the Fiscal Commission. Can the Minister outline what his plans are in terms of the relationship between both bodies and ensurance that the Fiscal Commission will take into account how we are spending our money at the, presently, at the present moment in time when considering any tax varying powers? Well, the member will now know, I suppose, from the membership of, of both bodies that you have people with very substantial experience uh, and ability in these matters. Uh, and of course, there is a, an interconnection. Uh, and I would expect that, pardon me, when the Fiscal Commission is a time limited body, and when it completes its work, hopefully by the end of this calendar year, in order to present a report to me, uh, that such a report will also become part of the ongoing work of the Fiscal Council itself. And should an incoming executive decide to take up, uh, some of the issues in relation to transfer of tax varying powers, then clearly that does become a matter for the Fiscal Council. So there is an, an interplay between both of them. Uh, I, I want to see them um, and intend to meet uh, the chairs of both uh, the Council and the Commission this week uh, and the membership then next week. And I'd like to see them as early as possible, given the circumstances we're all in, but as early as possible to begin that level of engagement uh, with this institution, with the Finance Committee, uh, with others uh, uh, to, to uh, discuss the, their business as they go forward. And uh, I think. As I say, the, as a, a fairly broad uh, welcome, a widespread welcome for the establishment of both bodies, but also some of the personnel we've been able to attract onto both of those. Uh, and I, I look forward to working with them time ahead, and I'm sure uh, members here will look forward to that engagement also. I call Andrew Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his response. I would congratulate the Minister and the officials in the Department for the signings that he managed to secure for the Council and the Commission. Um, in terms of the budgetary process which comes through this Assembly, how will he ensure that the advice of the Fiscal Council feeds into that budgetary process so that when we are analysing that legislation that you are often sitting here for days and end for, uh, is actually taken into account in terms of the professional advice from those individuals you managed to recruit? Well, I think that's, that's the function of, of the Council, and it's not just for the Finance Department, it's for the Executive's finances as a whole, but obviously if we have responsibility for managing those, uh, it's a key uh, relationship with our department, uh, and that's why the, our department will bear the cost uh, and the administrative support of both Council and Commission. Uh, but yes, I, I look forward to that. I, I look forward to a situation, firstly, uh, and the, the, the Deputy Speaker will recognise this from our conversations over many times, where we have a much more simplified budget process, that we have the time to do it properly, because we have uh, sufficient time in terms of the announcements coming from uh, Whitehall, uh, that we have a multi-annual budget, which we can plan and uh, align a programme we're coming to. And in that, in that scenario, I think a Fiscal Council will have a, a very support, important supportive role in not only advising the executive, but in their general uh, informing, uh, I think, of all of us in terms of the public finances and how we best manage those. I call Matthew Till. Deputy Speaker, perhaps unsurprisingly, I'm going to ask on the same subject. So I've been slightly geeky on this thing. Um, uh, can I ask the Minister to confirm the way I certainly welcome the establishment of both of these organisations? Um, first of all, will the, um, the Fiscal Council, in a statement, he said it will be, uh, it will be um, introduced, it will be put in legislation. Can he give a timeline for when that legislation will be introduced? And secondly, um, can he clarify that it will be fundamentally independent from the department? Because that's a completely critical bit. At times, this organisation will have to say difficult things for your department, and that's part of the purpose of it doing a job properly. Uh, well, the, as I said, the experience in other jurisdictions has been established a Fiscal Council and then. Uh, legislate to underpin 
the work that it needs to do. So uh, I, I'm hoping that if that is required, and if it gets off to a, a good start, that we will be able to do that in this mandate. And I, if that's required, then I certainly uh, would like to, to get work on that. I know I've had discussions with the chair of the Finance Committee, and he said, I, I know he can't purport to speak for the whole committee, but he said they were very keen, the committee would be very keen to see this happening and would be uh, very willing to work with us in the time ahead to try and make sure that's done. In terms of independence, uh, although the department is providing the budget for it and we are providing some backup resource for it, it will have absolute independence from the department. It is not uh, in control of uh, uh, and, and the, the, the people, as I say, certainly in relation to the Fiscal Council, uh, Robert Choate, uh, people who are very broadly experienced in this matter will know how to manage that line between the necessary resource and support they get from government, but actually providing an independent advice uh, service to government. Call Matthew Till for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and, and thank you to the Minister. Further to that, can you confirm that both the Fiscal Commission and the Fiscal Council will have, um, it's alluded to in the statement, but it would be helpful if the Minister could be really specific about it, that they'll have independent uh, economic forecasting resource, and it might be the same for both, in the sense it might be the same people doing it. And secondly, will the Fiscal uh, Commission, once it reports, and would, can you be clear here that that will report not just to him or to the department, but to the public and to the Assembly? This is the Commission I'm talking about. Thank you. Well, the, uh, the, can I say in relation to the Commission, yes, uh, I want to make sure. Uh, I, I think it's much better if this is a public debate. Uh, and for it to be a public debate, then the, the Commission will, will have to be out engaging uh, with members of this House, but also with the business organisations and uh, with other uh, people and organisations uh, who have an interest in, in this matter. Uh, and, and I think uh, such a report will come to me in the Department, but it would be my intention to have that, uh, a public airing of that, because I think a debate around that in this institution would be very appropriate at that time. Uh, because this, uh, uh, this will be in the run-up to the end of this mandate. I think it's very important for people to be able to uh, speak on these matters and to perhaps give a sense uh, in terms of the election itself. And I don't mean this is an election matter, but I mean in terms of the, the creation of an incoming executive, uh, it would be very helpful to understand the public mood and public debate uh, in relation to these matters. Uh, and in, in terms of the, the resource for either Council or Commission, I mean, this, what we have put forward is the initial establishment of both bodies. We are happy and will determined to work with them to make sure that they can do the job that they need to do. So whatever uh, support they need, we are very happy to consider that. And I call Morris Bradley. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, his answer so far. Minister, following the reform of property management uh, programme, which has been focused on making a more efficient use of the government estate, I welcome the Minister's commitment to promote uh, regional recovery and regeneration in areas across Northern Ireland. However, could I ask the Minister for his rationale in excluding Coleraine as a hub, and in doing so, uh, pre uh, prevented the people of the North Coast and the North East of Northern Ireland to be part of this recovery and regeneration? Well, I, I forgive my geography, but I thought Bally Kelly was on the north coast, and that's one of the first schemes that we're rolling out. And we're not excluding anyone else from a scheme. So there's no saying this, these are the ten that are under consideration, and that's it. Uh, there is a programme uh, to roll out, which recognises, firstly, uh, in, the, in the creation of the criteria, and he's right, we added in a criteria of being able to support local economic development, and, and that's important uh, that, that the central government does that wherever it can. Uh, in terms of uh, locating its own services, uh, but also uh, the travel pattern from people from various parts across the north into Belfast. So we, we kind of map the travel routes of the civil service staff coming out here every day uh, and, and to see where those figures were highest. Uh, and then the ability to work with local government or indeed where there were a uh, central government estate that was readily available to do all that. So there are a number of factors in the consideration of all that. And I would ask the member if, if he is keen that Coleraine be considered to engage with uh, either through the council down there, because I'm sure there is an engagement with the Causeway Coast and Glens, uh, or himself to engage with the officials in the Department of Finance to get an understanding of how that criteria was set and how it will apply into the future. So this isn't to exclude anyone. This isn't the end of the programme. Uh, we want to get it rolling out in the areas that, that meet it most in terms of the criteria, and then I, I would anticipate fully it will be successful and that other areas will, will follow suit. Paul Morris Bradley for a brief supplement. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. I will be brief, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, I will remind the Minister uh, that the County Hall located in my constituency is a building that once held several 
government uh, departments uh, is currently half empty at the minute. Uh, and I was wondering if during this rationalisation of government estate, does the Minister have any plans uh, for uh, utilisation of this seven storey building in the heart of East London area? Well, I am sure that the officials that were tasked with working on this uh, and uh, uh, there were some tasks from SIB to work with us on this and to work with local government organisations. Uh, we will be looking at all of the civil service estate and all public uh, buildings across the north to see what can be utilised. It both depends uh, what state it is in, what, who is using it uh, and how it can be. We need to make sure that if, if civil servants are going to go in, and this is not to relocate jobs, this is to allow people to do the job that they are doing up here in Belfast a couple of days a week closer to home. It means they, they can have a better work-life balance. They are spending their money in the local economy while they are there, and they are cutting down on carbon emissions in terms of transport in and out of Belfast. Uh, but we want to ensure uh, that the facilities are ones that people want to go into. So there are going to have to be an investment in them to make sure they are, have all of the connectivity that they need, uh, that they have the surroundings are conducive to actually attracting people in to work in them. Uh, so I, I again would, I would ask them to go and engage with some of the officials involved in that uh, and put the case in relation to County Hall and Coleraine. And that concludes our time for questions to the Minister for Finance. The next item of business is an urgent oral question to the Minister for Health. I invite members to take their ease for a few moments until the minister and members uh, are in the chamber. <laughs>